Good morning, everyone. And welcome to the CSUDH International Scholar Seminar Series. Um, this is our second year. Good morning, please excuse my camera is off, uh, but my name is, uh, it's not working right now, but my name is Armand Rucker and I am the Visa and Immigration International Coordinator in the Office of International Education. And it's my pleasure to introduce our Associate Dean of International Education and Senior International Officer, Dr. Hamoud Sali, who will introduce our guest speaker for today. Dr. Sali. Well, thank you very, very much, Armand. Uh, and it's a pleasure to have uh, Dr. Meghna Singhvi uh, with us today. Uh, Dr. Singhvi is a uh, Associate Professor here on campus. Uh, she has been a teaching accountant uh, for uh, many uh, years now and since 2006, I believe. Uh, she has taught and continued to teach undergraduate and graduate classes uh, several uh, places. Uh, she taught uh, at uh, Northern Kentucky University, Xavier University, Florida International University and Loyola Marymount. Uh, before uh, coming to Cal State Dominguez Hills, where she's been here for, uh, I believe, for the last um, uh, three years, uh, Dr. Singhvi. Uh, Dr. Singhvi research uh, focuses on corporate boards, uh, ESG investing, audit uh, committee director turnover, CEO power, and sustainable investing, her latest papers, Audit Fees After Remediation of Internal Control Weaknesses was, was cited in the prestigious uh, Dodd-Frank Act of 2010. Her focus has been on internal controls uh, since 2008. She has spent numerous hours on studying systemic controls and account specific internal controls. She has also studied the remediation of internal controls in depth and continues to study SOX compliance. She attributes much of a company's success to the tone at the top and culture. Uh, Dr. Magna will, will give her, her lecture uh, and she will be taking questions at the end. Uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Signifi. It's a pleasure having you in our series and thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Salhi, and thank you so much, Ormond, for inviting me. This is truly an honor. And uh, something personal that I want to share with the audience is I came to the US as an international student in um, the winter of 2002. So I can understand who is in the audience, uh, and I respect and uh, uh, salute your courage for uh, making this journey. And when I came here as an international student and talked to the professors, I knew that one day I'm also going to be a professor. So I'm very honored to be a part of this scholar series program. And here is my presentation on a company that I'm sure you have seen in your day-to-day -day life. It's called Waste Management. So the company Waste Management, they had an IPO, which is an initial public offering in the year 1971. It was founded by Dean Buntrock uh, in 1968. Just in within three years, he was able to take the company public. During the 70s and the 80s, uh, Buntrock built a vast disposal and uh, company. And you can imagine how did he do it so quickly? Well, the secret was he kept buying smaller and smaller competitors. That was one of his secrets. So he made almost uh, 200 acquisitions and buying other companies. Growth. The company experienced tremendous growth in the first 20 years. Uh, the waste management had 36% average annual growth in revenue and 36% annual growth in net income. The company grew from only $16 million in 1971 to become one of the largest waste removal businesses in the world 
of the uh, grabbing a revenue of 7.5 billion in 1991. That is enormous growth. If you take a look at the company today, you will see that if you had invested in the company a few years ago, your return would have grown much more than the S&P. The S&P is right here, the S&P 500 index and the Dow Jones. So this company in the past five years, even with the pandemic has done extremely well, but this was not the case when there was fraud. A few decades ago, this company's stock price dropped more than 33% and investors lost more than $6 billion. Let's discuss how that fraud was perpetrated, who were the people behind that fraud, and how uh, accounting fraud can be perpetrated, and how you as an investor need to have a very prudent eye whenever you invest your money. Fraud can be attributed to many things, but I have narrowed it down to company culture, aggressive accounting, weak auditor judgment, and greed. One of the things that was there within the management of uh, the company was if there was any, a gray, any sort of a debate on which path to take, they always took the more aggressive path. This is the direct quote from one of the former controllers who was the CFO or controller of the company. We always had a tendency to take aggressive stances. So the management and the tone of the company and the culture was let's be aggressive. And, uh, one thing to keep in mind is during the time that they were growing, North America, and uh, with the, within North America, USA and Canada were starting to come up with very stringent environmental laws. So as waste management grew its operations to Europe and entered new industries, such as uh, handling hazardous waste, converting waste into energy and the environmental business, the company's new businesses did not perform as well. So they were making foray into new businesses, but the returns were just not there. At the same time, the North America operations were also suffering because there was heavy competition and there was a lack of landfills. There are limited landfills, as you can imagine. The new environmental regulations put a lot of pressure on the company and it gave, became very expensive obtain a permit to create a new landfill or replace or expand an old landfill. So you can imagine the company CEO, CFO, they are feeling the pressure because of the changes in the environment, environmental laws. So the gray area of accounting, despite these difficulties, the company CEO Buntrock and others continued publicly to project the company as if they are doing extremely well. But to sustain this kind of unrealistic growth and achieve predetermined earnings, waste management had to bow down and adopt to fraudulent accounting practices. They wanted to move back into the black. Whenever you read about a company that has moved back into the black, it means that now they are making profits. So how did they do it? Let's take a look at the overview of the scheme. To prepare the annual and quarterly financial statements, the company consolidated the results of waste management North America and other entities. After they closed the books, top level adjustments were made. And what did they do in the top level adjustments? they reduced their expenses. They didn't want investors to see as many expenses. They also started falsifying financial statements. So first, the operating results were reported by different units. The different units are spread across different organizations. So waste management recorded the depreciation expense 
of each, each of its trucks. You can see one of these trucks over here. Using an eight-year life, this truck usually lasts them about eight years and has no salvage value. A salvage value is basically the value of the truck at the end of the life of the asset. What can you get for it when the asset is completely dep uh, depreciated? So top level adjustments were then recorded using a different set of assumptions. For example, in 1993, top management assumed trucks had a useful life of 12 years and a salvage value of 30,000. So what did top management do? They wanted to hide expenses. They did not want expenses to show up on the income statement. They wanted to keep the process a secret by centralizing all, all uh, reporting. So the small groups throughout the organizations would report to them and somebody in the central office would change the numbers. The targeted earnings that were set by management, such as Bantrock and Rooney, were aggressive goals of growth, growth, and growth. So the company's small units felt the pressure to meet management's expectations of their high goals. These budgets were consolidated with the, budget, uh, with the top level adjustments to arrive at consolidated earnings. This is called managing earnings. The budget was created for administration and planning purposes and became a tool that top management started using. So they had a preconceived number that they wanted to meet. And no matter what happened during the year, their managers and subordinates were told that these are the numbers and you have to meet these numbers. So unrealistic expectations, unrealistic goals, and unrealistic pressure was set up on the entire company. They were also manipulating numbers. During the quarters, top, during the quarters, top management monitored the actual results or operations versus what was budgeted. When they saw that the real results are below budget, they just changed the numbers. They added journal entries and unbudgeted journal entries at the end of every single quarter. And they also reversed the total cost of amortization of the landfills by an arbitrary 10%. This decreased their expenses on the income statement and made their net income look good. And they sold themselves as if they're doing extremely well and growing. And that was not the case. Depreciation. As some of you may know, depreciation is wear and tear of an asset. For example, property, plant, and equipment gets depreciated every single year. Where does depreciation expense show up? It shows up on the income statement. So depreciation expense is actually fairly simple to calculate. You take cost of the asset, you subtract salvage value, which is what is the value that I'm going to get after the asset has run its full life. And then you divide it by the useful life of the asset. So let's say that the cost of the asset, the cost of the truck is $100,000. We expect to receive $0 at the end of its useful life. We divide it by eight years because we expect the truck to last us for eight years you get a depreciation expense of 12,500 per year. This depreciation expense is recorded on the income statement. One thing to keep in mind is you, if you want a high net income, then you can play around with depreciation expense. So if you want a small depreciation expense, you can make this denominator 8, 12. Look what happens when I change the denominator and I add a salvage value. The same truck with a salvage value of 30,000, which is a management estimate. Nobody's asking for proof. So management can easily create a fictitious number of 30,000. And then they can say, 
I'm going to divide this by 12 instead of eight because I expect this truck to last for 12 years. Look what happened to my depreciation expense. It went from $12,500, it dropped to $5,833. This shows up on the income statement as an expense and net income looks higher, which means all of a sudden you look more attractive to investors. Waste management also made some unbudgeted uh, adjustments. Unbudgeted adjustments are when top management extended the useful value of the trucks by two years and doubled the salvage value. I just did that in that example where I extended the useful life of the truck from eight to 12 years. So I used a more aggressive uh, example because I adjusted the, uh, the life of the asset from eight to 12, but management increased the useful life by two years and they doubled the salvage value. What the management also did is they conducted sweeps. What does that mean? If they had a good quarter, they held on to those reserves. They are known as cookie jar reserves. You can dip into those reser reserves anytime you have a bad quarter. And that's what Koning and Howe had done. In some quarters, they simply borrowed from future periods by prematurely recording some adjustments. All of this is violation of gap, which is generally accepted accounting principles. So you may ask, this is a public limited company. How did they get away with it? Where were the auditors? The auditors were Arthur Anderson, and they recommended that management stop the practice of recording these adjustments. They even created a warning letter known as a management letter. The letter noted that individual divisions are not being evaluated on the true results of their operations. Instead, somebody at the central office is creating numbers, which is not the truth. They said that all corporate adjustments should be passed back to the smaller divisions throughout the company. Guess what management did? When the auditors came up with this particular solution, management rejected that advice. Remember one thing, secrecy was extremely important to this company because this was the only way they could perpetrate fraud. These people who were involved in the fraud and who gained a lot of money while they were perpetrating the fraud, they regularly received information on top level adjustments and quarterly top level adjustments. And they did whatever it was needed to make the company look good. WMNA stands for Waste Management North America. One of the management executives was Getz. He received information and participated in decisions not to disclose such items. Every public company is required to have fair disclosure in their m &A section and in their annual report, which is known as a 10K, but they failed to disclose this information to stockholders. They continued to manage earnings. In the 14 of 21 quarters from the first quarter of 1992, through 1997, they used arbitrary numbers to report earnings just to meet company expect, public expectations. More and more managing earnings was done and it had become a major component of the company's reported profits. Take a look at this graph. From 91 to 96, this was the impact the more adjustments they made, the more their income looked higher and higher and higher. So they got on this bandwagon of greed to make sure they did any adjustments to make sure their pre-tax income looks high and higher. In addition to top level adjustments, these defendants also used other non-GAAP practices uh, which included misapplication of accounting principles. The linchpin was 
that they never really recognized current period expenses in the period of the income statement. They continued to bury expenses so that investors will not be able to find them. They continue to play around with depreciation expense. One of, remember, this is a garbage collection and waste process company. So one of their biggest assets are garbage trucks, containers, and equipment, which is around $6 billion. If they played around with depreciation and they manipulated this number, this really helped them look good on the balance sheet and on the income statement. They continued to conceal the fraud from the auditors. From 1998 to 1996, they made unsupported changes to useful life and salvage value. They kept changing depreciation expense. They kept making top level management adjustments in secrecy. They never disclosed these changes in footnotes to the financial statements, which makes me as an investor, I have one piece of advice for all of you who are watching. Whenever you're reading the annual report, start reading it from the back. Don't start from the front because that's where the flowery language is. And if management is trying to hide something, then it's definitely buried in the details. Coning how to Bexin let the error stand. They concealed it from their auditors and from the investors. And guess what? By 1996, the cumulative impact of that error of depreciation expense and understating that expense kept compounding and exceeded $100 million. This is a very large amount. The auditors were worried about their own reputation. Arthur Anderson was a very large firm and and they said that in each of the five years, the company had added new consolidating journal entry to increase salvage value or increase useful life. Arthur Anderson recommended that the company conduct a comprehensive one-time study to make sure that the assets are reporting appropriately their salvage value and their useful life. But top management rejected that advice and they continued to manipulate these numbers at the company headquarters. They even did collusion. For example, top management with the knowledge of gets agreed to provide support for the salvage values. In March of 94, six months after the company doubled the salvage value of its trucks, Koning instructed one of the agents to create a memo. That memo said, that the salvage value of the truck is $30,000. The page and a half memo was justified by management, but it was not based on any research or any sort of empirical data. It's like taking a post-it note and putting some numbers out there and then justifying with the purchasing agent of the company that this makes sense. The management was so aggressive that even they deleted some of the documents. In November 1995, Waste Management Controller initiated a one-time study of the salvage value of all the vehicles, equipment, etc. When a January 1996 memorandum of the study contradicted the company's salvage values, guess what the management did? They said, stop the research immediately and destroy all copies of the memorandum and delete all the documents from the computer hard drive. No additional work was ever performed. No memorandum or feedback was provided to the auditors. The top management continued to change salvage value of the garbage trucks, equipment and containers. One of the things that continued to show up on their balance sheet was goodwill because goodwill is recorded when a company purchases other companies. They carried land on the balance sheet at cost, even though it was impaired. They owned and operated more than 100 landfills. Their practice was to carry all of the land on the balance sheet at cost. 
However, accounting rules say that you must change the cost on the balance sheet if land is lower of cost or market. So for example, you acquire a piece of land for $100,000. But after a few years, you find out that the market value of the land has gone down to 60,000. You're supposed to change it in the balance sheet to $60,000, but they did not do that. The company was also required by generally accepted accounting principles to record an expense for any decrease in the value of the land over the life of the landfill. They failed to do that. Again, Arthur Anderson got frustrated and issued a warning letter. And they said, we are going to conduct a site-by-site -site analysis of the landfills. Top management never conducted the study, failed to reduce the carrying value of the land, despite action steps that were mandated by the auditors in 1994. They spent hundreds of, hundreds of millions of dollars to develop new landfills and to ex, uh, expand existing landfills. Obtaining the permits for these landfills was their bread and butter, and they did whatever it was needed to obtain these permits. They capitalized the costs relating to permit efforts. And only if the permits result in a successful acquisition of a landfill can these costs be capitalized. Otherwise, these costs have to be expensed on the income statement. The company systematically failed to do this. So basically, they acted at their own whim and fancy. Whatever they were supposed to take to the income statement as an expense, they did not take it. And instead, they took it to the balance sheet and capitalized it. Top management employed many tactics to avoid recording expenses. For example, if they were trying to get a permit for one particular landfill and it was unsuccessful or the project was left aside and abandoned, these permit costs were transferred to another site. And thereafter, the impaired or the abandoned were commingled with other assets and then amortized over the life of that site. This is known as basketing. The company referred to basketing and bundling to get away from hiding. They wanted to hide their expenses and they were able to do that successfully. They did not disclose any of their failed investments to auditors or to investors. They never disclosed that they were using bundling and basketing schemes to write off dead projects. They did, this, they did this, this, this for a long, long time, and they failed to show this in the MDNA section, which is also known as management discussion and analysis section. Waste management also capped off Arthur Anderson's audit fees. Remember, they were paying uh, Arthur Anderson for uh, auditing fees. However, one of the company executives said that they were they, uh, uh, that they wanted to keep Arthur Anderson for special work. What does that special work mean? The special work was basically consulting and the auditors were lured into extra money by waste management so that they can earn extra fees. Arthur Anderson's non-audit non fees related to consulting more than doubled during this period. So the auditor's hands were tied because this particular client was paying them so well. Remember one thing, pre-Sarbanes-Oxley Act, it was okay for auditors to do consulting and provide non-audit services to companies like waste management. However, this practice has been stopped after the passage of Sarbanes-Oxley, primarily to protect investors like you and me. Um, Arthur Anderson was awarded additional consulting projects to the tune of $3.7 million. 
and uh, therefore they continued to play the game with waste management. Despite a recession, waste management started 1992 with high expectations based on the goals set up by management. But during the year, the growth was not that good and the company, even after netting 111 million in current period expenses against an unrelated one-time gain, the company's financial statements contained additional misstatements in still larger amounts. So they continued to overstate income and overstate other measures of performance. How did they do that? By hiding their expenses. Remember they had an IPO in 1991? Guess what top management did? They used a portion of the proceeds of the IPO to offset prior period losses and prior period expenses. The netted items related to uncollectible receivables in Venezuela, anticipated costs associated with change of waste management's name and the write-off of some Kuwaiti equipment losses. All of these were written or all the IPO basically wiped off all of those prior period expenses. They inflated the company's profitability and continued to deceive investors. Finally, the details of this restatement came out in 1998. Finally, Waste Management announced that they were restating their financial statements for this entire period. At that time, the restatement was the largest in corporate history. Look at these numbers. The company admitted that through the first three quarters of 1997, it had overstated pre-tax earnings by $1.7 billion. It is one of the largest corporate restatements in history. These were some of the individual trading that they were doing of their stock because they knew that the stock price would go down. So Dean Buntrock avoided a loss of 4.3 million by selling the stock strategically. His foundation also traded and saved about 7.9 million. Rooney, another management guy, traded and losses avoided by uh, during this period from 92 to 97 was 6.7 million. And that brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Segmi. Uh, it was very, very interesting presentation. Uh, 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 I was, I'm wondering if you have any question. I think Jose, uh, uh, Jose, welcome. Uh, uh, you have your hand up. Does that mean you have a question? No, I was just applauding. <laughs> you were applauding. <laughs> uh, wonderful, Jose. Thank you. Thank you. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. Uh, I wonder, well, welcome Dr. Maladi. I'm glad you're here. I see uh, a lot of faces or picture or uh, screens names. I know you've done some other work, uh, Dr. Singvi. Uh, you mentioned uh, you, you followed also the trend in France. Can you talk a little bit about that too? Maybe maybe that will get people uh, so give you, uh, get an idea of the other interest that you do while not looking at frauds. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, I was uh, researching uh, some of the frauds that have happened in Europe recently. Um, um, it was actually a company based in Germany, uh, Dr. Hamoud. Yeah. It's called Wirecard Fraud. Uh, it, the name of the company is Wirecard. It was doing extremely well. It had reported around two, $2.1 billion in cash on their balance sheet. And when the auditors tried to verify that that cash actually exists on the balance sheet, uh, they were unable to find it and they were unable to confirm it with the bank. Um, as soon as the news got out, the stock price dropped tremendously. It was one of the sharpest drops. And even the German uh, equivalent of the SEC, which is responsible for investor protection, uh, is still looking for the executives who are still on the run. 
and they are trying to escape because a lot of investor money has been lost. So that is one of the other fraud uh, scandals that I'm following in Germany. Apart from that, there are other companies uh, that have been uh, extremely blatant in their accounting. Uh, um, because accounting is complicated, they tend to get away with hiding expenses and uh, uh, um, increasing their net income and boosting and making their financial statements look strong. So I think this is a good time for the audience to think about if you are investing in a company, it's critical that you examine the financial statements. It's critical that you examine who's on the board. Are these executives uh, playing fair and square or are they so aggressive in their management that they are doing anything to meet uh, expectations? That's one of the things I would say. Wonderful. Well, th thank you for that. Uh, any other uh, uh, other questions? Uh, please write, raise your hand if you have any questions. We could. Uh, Dr. You. Maladi has a question. Uh, Dr. Maladi, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much for organizing this. Uh, Dr. Singhvi, you explained uh, all the terminology really well. So, my question is more on most of the time we keep hearing the private sector fraud, and they probably get more audited because of the quarterly statements, et cetera. So I was wondering in the, in the public sector, uh, why don't we hear too much about frauds and how do we go about uncovering fraud in the public sector? Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Maladi, for your question. Uh, you're right. It takes a long time for uh, the public companies, uh, the fraud to unveil. For example, even in this case, they managed to hide it for so long. So one of the things I would say is, um, please watch out for uh, just chime in on an investor call for a public company. For example, if you're a shareholder in a company, the investor calls and uh, uh, there is usually a link sent on how you can join a conference call when the CEO and the CFO are making a presentation and judge the language. If they are using very flowery, lang flowery language, using rosy terms, uh, you will catch the red signals, the red flags much more quickly than auditors can or before the Wall Street Journal can. Because you as an investor want to hear directly from the CFO and the CEO. And these people are there on the investor calls. So well, I'm sorry to interrupt. I meant to say when I meant public sector, I mean government sector. Oh, I, I, I thought you're referring to public companies. Okay, so going back to government sector, um, I think it would be, very, it, it, it would be extremely okay. challenging. I think it would be extremely challenging, Dr. Maladi. Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, uh, Rachel, you had a question. You have your, uh, your hands up. Yes. Uh, thanks, Dr. Sahi. And thank you, Professor Magna, for that great presentation. And so I was just curious what happened to to those individuals that were responsible for man for manipulating uh, the company and you know playing with their accounting books what what were the consequences what happened to them uh they were all asked to pay a very large fine mm -hmm. by the sec and they paid that fine um and they were barred from serving as a ceo and cfo of any other public company for a limited number of years thank you no problem. Thank you for that question. So I have to ask you this, my, uh, Dr. Sengvi. You, you are a professor. Uh, you, your accounting is your, uh, is, is your interest. Why fraud? Why fraud? Because um, I think it's very interesting to look at weak internal controls. It's, oh, okay. just, it's just, I guess it's become my nature. For example, if I go to the airport uh -huh. and if I spot, um, it's a busy airport, 
and I'm looking around and I see that one of the, for example, CCTV cameras uh, are not working or not placed properly. It's just a natural instinct for me to spot red flags. And I do it in my everyday life. If, I, if I'm noticing it at a grocery store, for example, oh, I'm no. noticing it at an airport, for example. So I use that natural instinct that I have about security in the financial statements and in accounting. So what are some of the financial cases you looked at? Because I know you said a lot of them that you can share and think this is the cleverest way you can fraud, you can commit fraud. Mm, there is a, there is, please give me a minute, let me think. Sure, sure, yeah, 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 yeah. I, 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 I understand. Uh, the, 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 the management case is very, very interesting. Uh, there are a lot of, a lot of things has to do with how you report and all that stuff. Yeah. Yes, uh, there are there are many companies that have been very clever. Uh, I can't name one specific company, but I would say that they made the accounting transaction so complex, uh, so complex that everyday investors cannot understand it. And that's the cleverest way to perpetrate fraud. So it's, it's how complex that is, uh, they, they do it. So now in, 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 in the history of the American mafia, I mean, didn't they get, what is it? Is it El Capone that they got him on tax evasion? Yes. Would that be so, sort of similar to uh, fraud? Uh, is there a distinction between evading taxes and fraud? It's all this, in the same pattern. It's in the same uh, category. Uh, however, I would say that these executives that I have been looking at, for example, uh, there was a CEO, Denis Koz Kozlovsky of Tyco International. Um, he had such blatant expenses that he was using company money for. For example, he spent $5,000 on a bathroom shower curtain. Wow. $5,000. So what I would say that is that these kind of extravagant lifestyles of these executives, where they are getting away with investor money, public company money, and using it for their own personal greed and setting up bank accounts at tax havens all across the world, it is what my domain has been. And as far as tax evasion, a lot of them are getting away because they have offshore accounts. So uh, uh, th th that's fascinating. Uh, do, do we have any other questions from the audience? Hi, Jose. Hi, uh, I have a question. And uh, can you hear me well? Yes. Oh, yeah, please go. Yes. Uh, this is kind of like uh, thinking out loud. It's um, uh, it seems like there are always um, cases and examples of fraud, accounting fraud, for example. Do you think, from your perspective, that is becoming more prevalent, or is it just that now we have twenty-four hour media coverage that we can learn more about them, or is it is it more prevalent, or is it just more coverage? And the second question, um, uh, does uh, cryptocurrencies have anything to do with fraud in this sense? Because I might be wrong, but I'm thinking that maybe uh, that just the nature of cryptocurrencies might be, uh, I guess, a good medium to, to use if you're thinking about fraud. But I might be wrong, but I want to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jose, for those questions. The first question is, investor protection in the United States has increased tremendously after the passage of Sarbanes-Oxley in 2002 and the Dodd-Frank Act in 2010. So, Jose, the number of companies even remotely trying to do what waste management did is not possible. It has gone down tremendously. 
because the auditors are so worried about their reputation and it this this is not taken lightly at all so first thing is i have seen public companies being very diligent about their financial statements i have seen auditors being extremely careful about where they are signing off their name because their reputation is at stake we used to have eight audit firms and now we have only four so we cannot afford to lose any more auditing firms because that will be a very big hit to the investor community and the stockholders at large so first question is i have seen public companies be more accountable and auditors being highly diligent when it comes to making sure the books are good before they sign off and the second thing is with the rise of cryptocurrency and with the rise of um transactions all over the world i think the perpetration of fraud there's a likelihood that the fraud will go up in places where the internal controls are weak so if you are talking about a government organization for example dr maladi said if it's a high school if it's a, a church or if it's a smaller entity uh, with a, a public and a, a, a government entity but it doesn't have the internal controls in place the fraud chances are likely to go up whether it's through the normal route or through the crypto route but the crypto route makes it much easier to perpetrate fraud thank you very much uh, dr singhvi maybe when we look at sort of the advanced countries i mean you have a good system of uh, taxation uh, you have a culture of taxation uh people you know uh, commit fraud uh, within uh, or try to go by around the laws and, and commit fraud in, in countries where uh, like a third world countries is a fraud also manifested or found in uh, in legal documents like taxation or is it more outside the uh, the uh, the spec uh, i mean the uh, the taxation or uh, the reporting the auditing thank you thank you dr hamud what i have seen is there is an index known as investor protection index so if the investor of that country feels that there is a penalty for doing fraud mm. then the investor feels more confident in investing in a public company for example so there are some countries where investor protection is extremely high we are one of those uh, to have that in the united states since investor protection is extremely high over here we see the number of brokerage accounts being set up going up and up and up more and more 18 year olds now have a robin hood account than ever in the history of united states why are they participating in the stock market system or in the brokerage system or in the uh, buying index funds or mutual funds or companies like tesla why are they doing that that's because investor protection has gone up significantly so when you see investor protection goes up the individual investors start pouring their funds into the system but in some countries there's no there's no repercussion for fraud even if some executives commit such fraud they can just come back set up a new company start over play the game again and in those cases individual investors like you and me will not invest in the snp index or whatever equivalent that is instead they would invest in probably gold or different assets that's the only choice they have that's fascinating thank you for that uh do we do we have any uh, questions from the audience any hands oh well, thank you so much uh, dr magnason kwi this is a really really uh, very uh, uh, beneficial uh, i thank you for your time for the information that you provided it's uh, it's a pleasure hearing you 
Uh, and I think we've come, uh, uh, if you don't have anything else to, to say, uh, Dr. Singhvi, we'll, we'll come to the conclusion of this talk and we really appreciate it. I really want to thank you, uh, Dr. Hamoud Ormond, uh, for this platform. I have been looking forward to this presentation. I would like to warn and put a red flag for all the audience and investors who are watching. Uh, please read the annual report of a company. It is 150 pages long, but you can go into the investor call and shareholder call. Uh, make your money work for you. It is, it is very important to invest. Don't let this presentation scare you from, you know, public companies. Waste management actually now is a very good company to uh, probably look at. Uh, please, uh, please take my presentation as a warning sign that you as an investor should always look out for red flags, just like you would want to protect your family at the airport, at the supermarket, the way I am always watching for red flags. In the same way, you want to protect your money and you want your money to work for you. So please continue to invest is the most important lesson, Dr. Hamoud, that I would like to share with all the participants. Make your money work for you. I think we'll end with that. And, and again, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Singhvi. I look forward to seeing you again, hopefully on this platform as well. Take care. And thank you for uh, your, your participation, uh, for uh, 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 linking to this uh, presentation. Armand, are, are we gone? Yes, thank you everyone for, um, for coming.